Okay, Shabbat Shalom to, to everyone who's joined us here in the live gathering and uh, wherever you may be in the world and, uh, and for all those who are joining us on video. And uh, we meet every Shabbat at 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. So uh, if you uh, want to come and join us or know how to do that, you just go to the rivershabbat.com website and you scroll down and you'll see subscribe to our newsletter. And uh, you just put in your email address, your first and last name, and that puts you into the community list. And we send out the Zoom link uh, every week uh, to join us in the live gathering. So come and join us uh, as you're led to do so. All right, we are continuing our journey here. We've got uh, Shame of the Prophets, the book of Micah. Um, this, this is a very interesting um, this is a very interesting chapter. It's a, it's a punchy little chapter um, as we continue to work through just trying to apply uh, some of these lessons that were occurring at this time where Mike had been put into the Southern Kingdom uh, leading up to the various judgments that were going to go on in both the Northern and Southern Kingdom. And so um, one of the things that, uh, that we are looking at is we're kind of using uh the book of micah as a compass to not only understand what happened and what what are these things that the cons the house of israel constantly seems to face but also to um some of that application and what it could mean for us today so um so we're going to continue on with this and uh, this one is one of those punchy sort of little chapters um and it definitely is one of those messages where i have something in here to offend everyone so um Again, I always say, if you're not offended at some point in the teaching, just keep going. You will be by the end of it. Um, one of the things that we are dealing with uh, as we really consider why, why Micah was put and given by uh, to the uh, southern kingdom uh, at this time in the history of the house of Israel um, was uh, relating back originally where he started off to the transgression of Jacob. So, um, we're going to continue on in this and uh, just have a little bit of look at a few things because he starts to get into something quite interesting here. I've got our own house here, uh, and this is a quote by Edmund Burke, and he says, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. And if we were to take this and apply this to a house of Israel and the prophets, um, we see that there was, a, you know, when we looked at part one, that there was a link to a transgression that Jacob uh, was actually uh, Mike is referring to, and he's identifying something that uh, that Jacob had allowed. And I, you know, in that part, if you haven't seen it, go back and look. But we're suggesting that there was a complicity um, concerning his own family, his own house, and as one of the, you know, the father of the face, and would give uh, birth to the uh, the sons of the house of Israel, um, that he was allowing something. Now, he wasn't necessarily engaged in it, but he was complicit to things that were going on in the family that actually were concerning matters of spiritual adultery. And Jacob, in behavior and in some of these practices, it appears that he'd been looking the other way. And so one of the things we talked about was that when it came time for him to truly come into a place of repentance himself, one of the very first things he was addressing was the spiritual adultery and some of the practices that were happening with his own family. And so this is interesting. So his very first thing that he uh, instructs is a part of that repentance. So it's very interesting um, because there's a lot of discussion and various views on what the actual transgression of Jacob is. But I think it becomes clearer and clearer as we understand and use Micah as a compass to understand why Micah even raised this concerning uh, Jacob. So so we've been sort of working our way through the transgression. We looked at the time of evil last week and what really evil is and what good is in this whole tree of knowledge and good and evil. And then he does this punchy little chapter here in part three with uh, shame of the prophets. And um, this is where he gets, um, you know, into quite a, an interesting place. He, most likely very coming much very much from a common um poor background micah would have been in 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 his hometown um he would have been seeing a lot of um oppression 
of the poor and a lot of things that were going on in the house um, that was being facilitated essentially from Jerusalem and the leaders at that time and so he was this was all hitting close to home and so you can kind of see why the father put him in there um you know being a contemporary uh, at the time with the prophet isaiah and they are sort of working with the southern kingdom as they're going to head towards a judgment that's coming you know roughly 130 years uh from his writings as best as we understand and of course we just dealt with and what had happened in the northern kingdom is samaria had been judged uh, or was about to be so you know you've got all this corruption and stuff coming from the ruling uh, uh, from the religious ruling class out of Jerusalem and so he's warning the people of this coming destruction and a lot of this is linking back to Baal uh, worship and even some of the things that perhaps uh, Jacob had been complicit in in sort of uh, uh, looking the other way regarding his own family entertaining some things um, and so uh, in the northern kingdom, the same thing was happening. And of course, the father had placed uh, at the same time Amos and Hosea to work with the northern kingdom. So we've got a lot of stuff going on in the house in both kingdoms in the house of Israel that were uh, divided. It, and the, you can see how the father's putting um, his uh, prophets who are standing up. So they're not just looking at this and doing nothing. They're actually willing to say it. So, you know, that quote that Emin Burke, although relating it uh, more to our secular world, if you really understand, if we don't have good men in, in the body and servant leadership standing up and saying things like they are right now uh, and being honest with both uh, sides of the river, as I like to put it, um, then the triumph of evil occurs. And so one of the reasons why we're doing this with Micah as a compass, one of the reasons why we're looking at this is that this is happening right now in the body. So we're coming to the end of the age and we're not seeing a lot of those who are so-called serving the body actually saying this in both, uh, in a sense, a southern kingdom and a northern kingdom sense, or as I like to reflect both sides of the river. And so uh, this is why there's an address concerning the house of Israel. And what the house of Israel loves to do, the northern and southern kingdom, is they love to point the finger and say, well, they're, you know, they're doing this or, you know, they're not as bad as us and everything else. But it's quite interesting how the father was using his good prophets to actually raise the alarm in both kingdoms. And I think that that is necessary today. And so that's a little bit about what we're doing today and why we're doing it um, and so on. So um so uh, we've got micah and we've got isaiah they're dealing with the southern kingdom of judah and they really saw the same conditions that existed what was going on in the northern kingdom and they're saying hey we better look in our own house because judgment's now coming for us and so this is what we're starting you know to see in this moment of time and uh and so judah's getting a warning in here so what is a prophet well the prophet the navi in hebrew and what it really means, so this Hebrew word for prophet, this, uh, this Navi, this uh, Nun Bet Yod Elof, uh, comes from the term of the Niv uh, Setafayim, uh, meaning fruit of the lips. So this is very interesting. We have a modern take on, you know, prophets or people who divine the future and do all this kind of stuff. But actually, if we understand it from an Hebraic mindset, the fruit of the lips is going to relate to anything Yah would have them understand or to say whether that be blessing, whether that be curse, whether that be an understanding of judgments to come. It's more about that the fruit of their lips of the true prophets will always produce good fruit. The, the, uh, the root word of this, um, uh, the Nevada, the Hebrew, um, to prophesy under the influence of the divine spirit. And this is, um, or they can be false prophets. So what, what we're seeing is, is the ones who are doing this under the divine are actually bringing in warning at this time concerning the need for the house of Israel to repent. The false prophets were forecasting the exact opposite. So the Navi, um, the English word usually translates prophet. Okay, so the connotations generally in the West is one who is able to predict the future. That is not a Hebraic understanding as we discussed. And, uh, and of course, the root word um, um, is not 
necessary implying the the ability to predict the future and all this kind of thing. That's more a divining um, mystery Babylon, um, the occult religions, these sorts of things that had come in. Whereas again, the Hebrew understanding is the fruit of your lips being obedient to discern, to um, relate and be able to get the message across to the house um, as instructed by Yah. Um, again, there's also, there's many interesting connotations here um, when you get into elements of, uh, in the Torah and the Exodus and, in the, and obviously Isaiah at the time of Micah as well. And you get into the, uh, the niv, which is really an outgrowth or something that flows from. So you've got this fruit of the lips and it's flowing forth. It's coming forth. Um, and so it's coming uh, forth. And the source is actually Yah. So they're actually going to become a vessel uh, uh, to, for, for Yah to flow through and to bring the opportunity for good fruit. Uh, to come into the house of Israel if they will hear it. And, uh, and that's whether it be blessings, curses, judgments, whatever it might be. Um, but of course, at the time of Hosea and Isaiah, it was particularly a uh, warning of impending judgment and uh, because of the state that they were in. Um, there's also um, the one who expresses words of reproach as seen and used in, in uh, Bereshit or in Genesis 27. Uh, the Navi is, is, you know, Christian Western sense, this one that is foretelling, essentially, um, they, they try to present themselves in a certain way. And the, the Christian church generally chops up, you know, these five components that the apostle Paul would talk about, we call it the fivefold or whatever it is. And, you know, in Christianity, we generally separate these, oh, they're a prophet and they're a, you know, they're an apostle, that's an evangelist, that's a pastor. And is this really what the scripture talks about um, in relationship to the need for the fruit of the lips to come forth in the body? And is this what Paul meant, how we're seeing this play out? So you've got a, a Hebraic uh, understanding of how it works with the fruit of the lips. And then you have the modern Christian one, which has chopped them all up and sort of said, well, you're this, you're this, you're this. And they like to call them different offices and things like this. Um, most scholars today now pass to the true meaning. So when it comes to all of this is to call. And which is interesting because scripture does say that you are called, you are chosen people, the one who calls out a people upon Elohim. So when, when we're in the fruit of the lips of, um, of a Hebraic understanding of the prophet, you will be calling people to action. And as a result, they'll be coming out of whatever it is they're in that they uh, uh, are doing. So it's a called out people. And this course then links into uh, what we understand as the kahal or in the Greek, the ecclesia and in the modern English is often used the church. So it's calling his people and they uh, and the fruit of the lips are going to bring forth uh, something good um, uh, that will be good. Now, it doesn't mean their message is one that you want to hear, though. <laughs> so Yah's view of the fruit of the lips may not sound like it if we're getting a warning. And of course, um, this actually occurred. And we see this happen to Jeremiah, where actually the words of Micah were sparing him because the religious people didn't want to hear what Jeremiah was about to say, because the impending judgment of, of uh, the southern kingdom in Jerusalem was at hand. And they thought, well, instead of listening to him, let's kill him. <laughs> and so this is what happens. Uh, and so um, they were struggling to see uh, Jeremiah just before the judgment of the time as being, well, is this, you know, how is this good fruit? You're not telling us anything we don't want to hear. And it's the same today. Everybody's looking for itching ears one way or another. And of course, we're warned about that. So nothing new under the sun. And I have to throw this in here just as it relates to uh, the donkeys, the Navi, um, the English word uh, navigator, in my opinion, is better linked to the Hebrew um, uh, as, as we think of uh, Navi and the prophet, um, as opposed to this general Western stereotypes where the donkey is one of these two creatures, animals recorded in Torah uh, and in all of scripture that use actually the true gift of tongues um, as a servant. Um, which is there for us. And this is always for the purpose of the hearer. And of course, in the case of Balaam's donkey, it was Balaam because he was an apostate prophet for hire. And so there was something he wasn't seeing that this, his, his beast of burden was. And then of course, that was the presence of uh, Yeshua 
Hamashiach himself. And um, so the donkey spared his life in that moment uh, to help some repentance happen uh, for Balaam, but it didn't end up so well later on down the track for him. Um, but I do believe that this analogy or this shadow picture of this animal, the donkey, if we understand the creature, and if you've not seen the series Beast of Burdens, uh, Beast of Burden, um, go, it's a three-part series, and go and have a look at why actually um, what the Father's built into his creation and teaches us, and it's a shadow picture of understanding, you know, and I believe that this particular creature is a hidden shadow type or revelation uh, of the Navi uh, regarding a servant shadow picture and the characteristics that go with it, if we will have eyes to see and ears to hear. Okay. This is where we're going to start, where um, we've got something to offend everyone. Um, and so um, uh, hang on uh, with this, but um, it's something I believe that's very necessary for the house as we come to the approach of the return of the king in the end of this age for us to revisit the lessons uh, that uh, are so valid and uh, and so rich within uh, this, this great prophet Micah. In 1 Peter 4, 17, it says, for it is time for judgment to begin at the household of Elohim, for it begins with us. What will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of Elohim? And what's interesting here is, it's not saying judges only for the house of Israel. It says it begins there. So there's an effect to anything that will play upon the earth. But what we're seeing here is that it must start in our own house first. So um, it, uh, repentance must start here. Um, the blessings, the curses that go with that, but also judgment. And so this is that aspect of judgment that's coming in. It must start here, but it will flow out. Okay, so it's beginning there. A lot of us tend to sort of think, you know, judgment is in the, you know, for the house of Israel. And it's like, no, it goes much wider. He's the creator of all things. Um, but what is interesting, often missed in this little, little verse here contained in First Peter, is that it's directly linked to the true gospel. So the judgment that it begins in the house is being linked directly to the understanding of the great plan of redemption, the true gospel. And of course, what we're warned about coming at the end of the age is that there's going to be another gospel. There's going to be a false gospel and these sorts of things. So um, it's amazing what you'll see and how it links this. And so it's making this direct connection for us to go that this judgment is being related to the actual obedience and understanding of the true gospel. And so this is often missed. So our modern sort of prophet spectrum here, we are seeing blessings, not repentance being taught now. I'm generalizing here, but we are seeing this on a large scale on both sides of the river uh, in, in various different ways. We're seeing rewards talked about, but not an understanding of judgments and how they relate to these sorts of things. Um, we're often seeing fear right now being pumped out. All this, you know, uh, fear porn and click baiting and all this kind of stuff. And it's coming without uh, true biblical hope that comes with repentance, that will come with judgment, will come hope. And we see this works versus salvation-based type of thinking where we're seeing people thinking that they can earn, you know, what the blood that covers us are is if somehow they can become not uh, someone who misses the mark, um, as opposed to actually spending this time and knowing that his blood justifies us, he's going to take us to a glorified state but in this place in the middle where the sovereignty of man and the sovereignty of the creator meet is this place called sanctification. And we get this wedding garment preparation. So we're seeing all this confusion in these areas amongst the modern prophets on both sides of the river right now. And what I'm going to suggest to you is what you're seeing is we're getting mystery Babylon influence versus the understanding of the house of Israel influence. And this is a big deal right now. So we're getting a lot of the mystery Babylon, Babylonian religion and, and this kind of spiritual adultery that's made its way into the house that we have right now at this time.
And so we're seeing this on both sides of the river. We're seeing this in modern Judaism, Hebrew roots, Messianic movements, and we're seeing it in all the variations of the Christian movements. And so we're seeing this northern and southern kingdom picture, shadow picture, if you will, actually occurring as we come to the end of the age. And so it is important now that we understand what Micah was dealing with all back then, we are dealing with now. Nothing new under the sun. There's, and, and so this whole thing, now it may play out and express itself slightly, uh, you know, in different ways as in a physical manifestation, but all the components are there, the fingerprints and the hallmark of Mystery Babylon, this whore of Babylon that has made her way into both camps, because until the father restores the house back together again, we're sitting in this situation as we come to the close that there's st this stuff in the house, and it's going to bring about ultimately the fulfillment of the fall uh, Moedim, um, and, and the judgments that come with it and all these sorts of things. So we are very much in a similar situation, but we're now at this end of the age. So what occurred and what Micah was addressing has, uh, I believe, extreme value here. Uh, I've got the quote here. In their extreme forms, Judaism will use the Torah to bring death, and Christianity will ignore the Torah unto death. But for those who are in a true uh, a state of true repentance, the Torah and his spirit together will bring life. So it's important that we can use the truth or where righteousness is defined by our creator, but we can use this and, um, to bring death or we can ignore it unto death, or we can get ourselves into a place of repentance and allow us to uh, involve all his word, all his testimony, all the understanding of the prophets, which Yeshua, as we spoke about last week, pointed to the prophets as a part of his answer concerning what were the greatest commandments. Because he knew that these were the good men that were serving Yah, the servants that stood up and spoke against the evil that was occurring. So in Isaiah, the contemporary of uh, the contemporary of Micah, we've got this statement that he's making here. He's saying, "Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and shrewd in their own sight. Woe to those who are the heroes at drinking wine, the valiant men and mixing strong drink, who acquit the guilty for a bribe and deprive the innocent of his right or his inheritance." Now, this is interesting. We've got corruption essentially in the house and they're giving a toast to themselves. So we looked at this basically um, uh, last week. But where Isaiah is coming from is, is not, not only do you think you're wise and you're okay in your own sight, you're basically glorifying it as a toast to one another. And as a result, you're willing to be bought off to look the other way. And so at least Jacob's transition wasn't his family buying him off to look the other way. Now this is happening. And the, and the deprived the innocent of his right or inheritance. So what's going on? And what Yeshua, he put it, he, he says, you're standing in the way that, that, that you, you, you people are not allowing. You shut the door to the kingdom in their face. And not only do you not enter in, you're preventing them from entering. In. So what's going on here? So this, the secular prophets, modern corruption, it's really easy, isn't it? It's always easy to pick on the world. And so we look at, you know, all of this stuff going on. The corruption is, is pouring out. You know, we're just seeing it all the time from, you know, the Bidens to the Clintons, the, the laptop debacle, the weave fiasco with, uh, you know, with Trudeau. Um, the corruption's going down on New Zealand and everything else. I'm in the Netherlands. And I'm just, what I'm doing is I'm linking you and I'm just making a point. This we expect in a godless, Torahless Rome. This should be actually expected if we really understand what the absence of the Ruach from these people's lives really mean. I just wish, and what I say to them is, well, at least they should have told you what you were voting for. You know, I, I say to Canadians and to, to the Americans and to the New Zealanders and, and uh, the Australians and, uh, and those in Great Britain and things, and, I, and I'm saying to them, well, you thought you were voting conservative or liberal or Republican or you know, Democrat, but you know, were you told that when you voted for a certain party that you were voting for the World Economic Forum? Because even the average person that's sucked in by all these kind of politics in the secular realm, they really didn't believe that. 
and they're now finding that out. And, and so there's, there's a sense of things being done in the dark. They're not even telling. So in the secular world, they're not even telling people. For instance, here in Canada, when people were making a vote for the Liberal Party, which Trudeau is the head of and, uh, and their coalition with the NDP, they weren't telling people that by voting for them, you're actually voting for the World Economic Forum because it was things being done in secret and in the dark. Most people that voted for Trudeau did not know they were voting for the World Economic Forum, but the actual party they voted for was the WEF. And this is playing out and everybody's so shocked now. And the same thing's happening in the States, New Zealand, Australia, you know, the UK. It's happening all over, basically, Ephraim and Manasseh and the spreading out from the British Isles, what we call the Commonwealth countries and the United States of America. And the contamination now is happening everywhere. But we should expect this modern corruption. It's always been, always will be. They're operating in their own wisdom. And they think that they're being wise and sneaky and toasting themselves. And so we can understand this all from that secular perspective. But really, judgment starts or begins in the house of Elohim. And what Mike is dealing with is not the Babylonian rulers, you know, he's not dealing with the secular kingdom rulers. He's actually speaking to those that are operating in the house. And so this is where the more important thing for us to truly understand as we come to the end. I know we can all get caught up in the modern day secular politics and everything else, but the real thing for us to understand at this time is the pattern that you'll see in scripture where the warning is to us what's going on in our house and to allow and understand those judgments. So we see here in Jeremiah 23, 17, as we get closer to what's going to be this judgment by King Nebuchadnezzar II, you know, from this Neo-Babylonian empire, and we're going to see this judgment that's about to take place. But this is what he's saying here. And this is where Jeremiah goes as well. He says, but in the prophets of Jerusalem, so he's directly identifying those that are supposed to be of the fruit of the lips, good, bad, ugly, whatever, in Jerusalem, okay, I have seen a horrible thing. They commit adultery and walk in lies. They're fornicating. They're spiritually wedded to false or foreign gods or ways that have made them, you know, their way in. In fact, to the point where they'd be hiding these things and everything else, like we see in scripture, both right back to Yaakov, but at the time, they would be hiding these within the temple system in their little cupboards and things like this. So something had come in and really started to corrupt things. They strengthen the hands of evildoers. So as a result of this, those who would do evil, so let's say those who would be you know, in the wider kingdoms or the, uh, the Torahless kingdoms, they're strengthening their hand because you're weakening the house by doing this. And we're seeing this now. We're seeing the evildoers encompass us while we're in this time of bondage because their hand is being strengthened because the house is actually in trouble. Our witness, our obedience, our understanding, our love, our commitment to understanding Yah's ways. And so what we're doing in the religious realms on both sides of the river is we are strengthening all of these secular politics that we're seeing. As a result, we're weakening uh, the, the, within the nation and therefore the evildoers can come in and do their thing so that no one turns from, from his evil. So this is what's happening. And we're seeing people do the strangest things now uh, with all sorts of movements. All of them, look at this, and just so you get it, become like Sodom to me and its inhabitants like Gomorrah. And we know what was going down in Sodom and Gomorrah and its judgments, and it was hideous. The way that this would fully express itself, and we're seeing this again right now on earth. Therefore, thus saith Elohim, the host, concerning the prophets, not concerning the secular leaders, the Democrats, the Republics, the Liberals, the Conservatives. No, no, no. Concerning the prophets. These are the words. Behold, I will feed them with bitter food and give them poisoned water to drink. For from the prophets of Jerusalem, or Jerusalem, ungodliness has gone out into all the land. So what's actually being held to account here is we don't get to blame the secular rulers and politicians. 
if we actually understand what Jeremiah is saying here is, is that the light's gone out in us. And so we're seeing the, uh, the fruit of that as such. So the prophets are entertaining everything, but what they're not doing is calling people to repentance and back to his ways. I was going to say this in uh, 23, 16, 17. Thus say the Elohim of hosts, do not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy to you, filling you with vain hopes. They speak visions of their own minds, not from the mouth of Yahweh. We're seeing all sorts of monkey business going out there, visions and dreams and everything else. People are essentially being lied to, mollycoddled within the believing uh, uh, um, body right now on both sides of the river. They say continually to those who despise the word of Yah. So if someone like me comes along, they'll say continually, continually to me. Because they don't want to read what's in there. They just want to try and do what's called an ad hominem, an ad hominem. So if you attack me and not listen to what they are, they're despising when you read these scriptures. They would struggle to listen to this teaching. No, no, it doesn't work like that. And, you know, da, 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 da. And, you know, Trump sent from God and is going to save the earth or whatever. And they don't want to hear it. They actually don't want to hear this. Their hope is actually in those who are evil doing. And we are seeing this in the believing world big time right now. So they actually despise the warnings, the compass, the lessons, the things that we should be taking heed. It shall be well with you and everyone who stubbornly follows his own heart. There's no heart circumcision going on. You're going to follow your own heart. They say no disaster shall come upon you. No repentance. And so this is happening. They will not hear a message like today. So who's got their, who's got their Bibles? Let's turn to... Chapter three of the book of Micah. Let's give everybody a moment here. Who's got their Bibles? Hands up. Oh, almost everyone that I can see. Of course, I wouldn't know. You can just put your hand up, can't you? <laughs> you sit there and say, oh, we fooled that donkey guy. <laughs> all right <laughs> nice okay all right let's start at chapter three then i said hear now O heads of yachab O heads of yachab well that if that's including the 12 tribes right and we're in a divided state we've got at least 10 that are being spoken to here and you rulers the house of israel now we got the southern kingdom in here should you not know right ruling? Should you? Never mind those unbelievers. Should you not know it? You who are hating good and loving evil. Look at this, the description. Tearing away the skin from my people and the flesh from their bones and who have eaten the flesh of my people and stripped off their skin and have broken their bones and have cut it up into a pot like a flesh in the, uh, in the cooking pot. Wow. And we're going to look at something regarding what Ezekiel talked about in the Valley of the Dry Bones and what the disciples in Yeshua warned about, about the ravenous wolves. Because the wolves will eat something to the point of cleaning the bones and then even starting to eat them. You're seeing something very interesting here. You are going to leave my people waste. But then there's a great prophecy by Ezekiel. It's going to relate to something here. We're going to have a look at that. Now, please. Therefore, when they cry to Yah, he does not answer them. Who's he not answering? The prophets. 
the ones who are supposed to be bringing forth the fruit of their lips. And in this case, it's a cry or a call back to repentance. It's a warning of impending judgment. They're not doing this. And hides his face from them at that time as they have made their deeds evil. Of course, in part one, we went over this whole good and evil. What is evil? What is this raw that is spoken about in the Hebrew? So wait a minute, their deeds are evil. So they're not getting off the hook here. This isn't, you know, the big bad devil. You mean there's actually some accountability going on here and the accountability is going on to the so-called religious leaders. Thus said the eye concerning the prophets, picking up here in verse five, who lead my people astray who are biting with their teeth and have called out shalom peace. They even set apart a battle against them who does not give for their mouths. So they're even going to backstab people because they're not participating in this wrong ruling that's going on. Therefore, it shall be night to you without vision. You're going to be brought into darkness. You're going to get to such a point where you don't have a clue what's going on. And the darkness to you without divination. So you're going to be in the dark and you're not going to be able to see anything. This is what he's going to do to the prophets. Those who should have been saying to the people what was going on as Micah and Isaiah were doing at this time. The sun shall go down on the prophets and the day shall be dark for them. Almost a leavened plague. And the seers shall be ashamed and the diviners embarrassed and they shall all cover their lips. Knows the prophet, the fruit of the lips, they will cover their lips for there is no answer. O Elohim. In other words, all the stuff they've been telling people, all the blessings instead of repentance and judgment, all of the things that they were doing, they're going to be embarrassed. Their false visions, their false prophecies, all these sorts of things. There's going to be a shame brought upon them. But truly, I am filled with power, with the spirit of Yah, and with right ruling, and with might to declare Yahab his transgression and to Israel his sin. Interesting. To declare Yahab's transition, which is directly linked to spiritual adultery and the complicity of it, not him personally, but all the stuff that was coming into the house. But the sin, the missing mark of Israel was participation now. So they were, you know, this complicity, this, this not saying Yah's ways and, and doing these sorts of things, allowing things to be done that should not be done. But then the participation that's going on apparently in the Southern Kingdom is they are actually engaged in missing the mark now. This is how bad it's gotten. Hear this, please, you heads of the house of Jacob and you rulers of the house of Israel who despise right ruling and distort all that is straight. So this infection, this things are have gotten to a point where they no longer can rule rightly. And so as Micah was experiencing, there was an oppression of the poor. There was this effect that was going on in the land. It was affecting literally where he was. And he's watching this play out. They are not, they are experiencing the physical reality of the spiritual not being dealt with. And he's living this. And he's going, what are you doing in Jerusalem? And he's warning them. He's saying what others will not say in Jerusalem. Because they've become blind. They're in darkness. They're entertaining all this stuff. Those building up, 
Zion with bloodshed and Jerusalem with unrighteousness. Now we're getting an inkling of the judgment. You're building this all up on bloodshed and you don't know it because what's about to come is judgment. And there's going to be bloodshed as a result. Her heads judge for a bribe. Whoa. Oh, we'll give you a ruling. Just set some money in my back pocket. I'll make sure it goes your way. And the people that are looking to do it are providing the bribe and the ones that are supposed to be doing the right ruling are accepting them. So does this look pretty much like the secular rulers? You better believe it. They're doing the same darn thing. Oh, it's easy for us to point to modern politics and say, look at the bribes and look at these people getting rich off of people in their nations as they steal away the inheritance of the people. Her priests teach for pay and her prophets divine for a price. In other words, if you want to hear a teaching, if you want to have some sort of understanding of the fruit of the lips, you better fork out some money. This isn't about giving to the house of Elohim in a tithe understanding. This is actually above that. Oh, no, 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 no. You don't even get the teaching unless you buy it. Yet they lean on Yah and say, so the, these prophets, they lean on Yah and they say to Yah, it is not Yah, not, is Yah not in our midst? Evil does not come to us. We do all this corruption, but Yah is here. Evil doesn't come on us. This is the prophets. These are the people who are supposed to be rightly discerning the word and bringing forth the fruit of flip, uh, 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 the fruit of their lips. And they're literally going, oh, Yah's with us. Wow. Just because he may be patient to allow people to repent, that doesn't equate to he's happy <laughs> with what we're doing. <laughs> and so this is, this, whole, this is why we want to be in a place of teshuva, repentance. Because his mercy and his patience doesn't equate to him going, oh, yeah, I'm fine with all this. Big difference. Therefore, because of you, Zion is plowed like a field and Jerusalem becomes a heap and the mountain of the house like a wooden height. Well, imagine that is the fruit of a prophet's lips and enjoying that one, especially if you're guilty. How well received do you think those words are going to be by people in the dark that are guilty of the very thing that he's saying, that they're actually the religious leaders who should be bringing forth and dealing with what's in the house? Let's look at this valley of dry bones. In Ezekiel 37, 1 to 3, it says this, and this is a prophecy over the whole house, so northern and southern kingdom. The hand of Yah was upon me. Now, look what Yah's going to do here. He brought me out of the spirit of Yah. Now, you're going to see overtones of something here. He sat me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. Remember what Micah was saying that the prophets were doing? Stripping their skin off, stripping their flesh off, stripping them down to the bones, and then even cooking the bones. And he led me around among them, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no Ra or evil. So this valley of dry bones. So Ezekiel is acknowledging something here. He's building upon an understanding of what the result of what's gone on in the house, entertained by the prophets, is now taking its course. Look what it says here. And behold, they were very dry. Very dry. Everything's been stripped away. They are spiritually void. And he said to me, son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, oh, Elohim, you know. Picking up at verse four. Then he said to me, prophesy over these bones. So now Ezekiel. The good one standing up, prophesy over these bones and say, oh, dry bones, hear the word of Yah. Notice 
what is the first starting point of bringing back a restoration of what the people have been left and strip dried. The first place that our creator starts with, oh, hear the word of Yah. And many of you on your journey have had to come back to revisit the word of Yah. Thus saith Yah Elohim to these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live. I will cause the Ruach to enter into you and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you and I will cause the flesh. Now we're seeing a whole reversal of where they'd gotten to in the state they're in. We're going to see a reversal as the Ruach comes back into this picture and brings them back to the word of Yah to come upon you and cover you with what? Skin and to put the breath in you, the Ruach in you, and you shall live and you shall know that I am Yah. And many of you are on this journey. As the Ruach comes back into us and we get back to the understanding of his way and his word, you are experiencing that you know and are getting to know Yah as a result. Your living prophecy, all of us, whether we know it or not. And these great end times prophecies by the great prophet Ezekiel, but what is bringing the bones back to life is they're getting the nourishing word of Yah again. Once again, it's happening. The prophets are starting to do what they should have been doing all along. They're bringing forth the fruit of the lips. They're not bringing forth itching ears. Or stuff for itching ears. Ephesians 4, 10, 12 puts like this. He who descended is the one who ascended far above all in the heavens. It says here, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the shepherds and teachers to equip the set apart ones for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Messiah. These are the elements that come with growing to the fullness of Messiah. And so we've spoken about this in previous teachings. But if you can think of the, the, uh, the, these five components, which are mentioned in scripture, which Paul was trying to lay out before he was going to reveal the great mystery, that if these are operating in a place of repentance and the fruit of their lips is good, you are going to see it in its various expressions, the evangelism, the teaching, the apostle, the prophesying, um, uh, the pastoring that's going to go on. And I often see the apostleship that Paul was dealing with is he's standing between the teachers and, you know, and those teaching and those prophesying, you know, keeping everything in line here. You're going to see the fullness and the expression of this come forth, just like Messiah. When Yeshua walked the earth was the fullest expression of all five of these components. The evangelist, the teacher, the apostle, the prophet the pastor, the shepherd of his sheep. He was all of them to their fullest expression. If we have a Hebraic understanding of what these all mean and not some modern Christian take. So as we grow to the fullness of Messiah, what Paul was saying is you're going to see these five things come forth. I believe this is required servitude of both a king and a priest. The fullness of Messiah. And I believe this starts to become this fullness is a requirement for a bridal governance in the final age. Matthew 7, 15, 16 says this, beware the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are what? Ravenous wolves. These things that the wolves do is they strip the carcasses to the bone. We see this in the shadow picture. If you've ever seen a pack of wolves actually eat something, you'll see this sometimes even with if somebody owns a dog, you know, try and take a dog's bone away. They will gnaw on that thing till there's nothing left. And they'll protect it until they do. They will keep going until there is nothing left. You will recognize them by their, look at this, fruits, the fruit of their lips. What are we looking for? something that will itch our ears or something that will truly bring us to a place of repentance. And what's actually captured in here in Matthew 17, 15, 16 is an interesting allusion to actually the fulfillment of the fall Moedim, which is based around the grape harvest and the nuts. 
Look at what it says here. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes and figs from thistles? And in other words, do you think a harvest is coming from these people? The ones that are promising you all these things, providing nothing and taking everything. We have all religious movements built on this. The Christian prophets are kind of easy these days in the modern corruption. It is unbelievable what is going on out there. And the stripping the people of any true understanding and the knowledge of the word of Elohim. And they are literally have been sucking the, the, the skin, the flesh, right to the bone of all the people that have been scattered. And particularly in the sons of Jacob and in, in Ephraim. But this is going to stop. And their corruption is going to be exposed. As they sit there and fly around in their jets and Hollywood mansions and driving their sports cars and not giving the word of Elohim to everybody and living off everything. How bad does this get? Bad. But we're going to actually, because we're talking Micah, the prophets of Judah. What's going on in Jerusalem? What's happening here? What are we seeing that was warned about this transgression that, that Jacob was complicit to, that worked its way through? The Christian side of this is a whole other journey. But today's focus is a little bit more on this. I've got the Messianic and Hebrew roots movements. I used the, the, the Pesach, the Passover this year to do a series. I'm warning about the leaven in both the, uh, the Christians' houses and the house of Yehuda. If you've not seen them, go back and review them. But this is particularly what Isaiah and Micah are dealing with before the judgment of Jerusalem. Look at what Yeshua is saying he's dealing with this system now. So that judgment had passed that Michael was warning about. They've come back. They've come back into the land now. And now the Sanhedrin uh, have set up camp with uh, Herod's temple. And Yeshua comes into the picture. So over those, you know, 500 years plus, we've gone right through the judgments and the warnings of Micah, Isaiah, what Jeremiah was doing before that. And then we've had the captivity and they've come back. And now we're right back. To the same place. How does this keep happening? Yeshua is dealing with nothing different here. Here we go again. This is this cycle. And what I'm going to suggest to you is we're on the last of these cycles for this age. We're back here again. The scribes and the Pharisees sit on, Mo on Moshe's seat. So do and observe whatever they tell you but not the works they do. So Yeshua is dealing with the religious system, the ruling Sanhedrin, Yehuda. For they preach, but do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders. You're going to carry the burden. But they themselves are not willing to move even a finger. They do all their deeds to be seen by others. Where they make their phylacteries broad. You know, this is where they would put the word and strap it to their forehead in the leather sacks. They make it broad so you can really see them. Their fringe is long. You would think of that as sitziot in today's speak. They make them even really long. And if I just wear these really long sitziot and you can see it all, then, you know, you know how set apart I am. Yeshua, and if we think anybody in these modern messianic Hebrew roots movements right now, understand the Torah better than these ones that Yeshua is dealing with, you are deceived. And we see the same stuff now starting to go on. And they love the place of honor at appointed times. They love that place of honor at the feasts and the best seats in the synagogues, the gatherings. This is the servant leaders. 
and the greetings and the marketplaces and being called rabbi, a little bit misleading there, the actual translation being more master by others. You should say, call no one else master. And we are seeing this stuff by the so-called religious leaders. And these are in the woes that Yeshua is going to give to them. I look, like I say, sometimes our brethren and, on, on, and all the stuff that's happening in the Northern Kingdom or in the Christian Kingdom right now in the house, that becomes easy for many of us that have started to take our journey deeper. But what we don't see is that there is a warning for Yehuda right now. And many of us that are involved with these Messianic Hebrew roots movements and whatnot, and, and, and how modern Judaism has crept into these movements and whatnot, we do not distinguish truth from, from tradition anymore. We do not distinguish what is Talmud and what is the word anymore. Look at this in 24 to 26. This is part of the woes that he's giving. I'm just going to focus on these ones. You blind guides. What was Micah saying? You're going to have darkness. Same things happened again and same things happening now. Straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. In other words, you're going to have arguments over the pronunciation of a name you're probably pronouncing wrong anyway. And by the way, Yeshua is coming back with a name written on a side which no man can know. So we're all getting it wrong. But the, the divisions we are seeing in the body because of this, this stuff, and it's separating his people, and it's preventing the people from entering in. Look at what it says here. Woe to you, scribe and Pharisees, you hypocrites. We're going to divide the body of Messiah? or a phonetic pronunciation of a name we're probably getting wrong anyway, but we're actually going to create division and cause people to stumble for you clean the outside of the cup. Oh, you wear your CTO. You're getting your Passover meal. It's all on display there, but inside you're full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, you prophet with the fruit of your lips, which is now in darkness. First clean the inside of the cup and the plate and the outside that the outside may also be clean. It's not what goes into us that defiles us. It's what comes out. And what sits inside a tomb? Dead man's bones. Right back to what Micah said, right back to the prophecies of Ezekiel, right back tomb we're being put in tombs and we're washing this, those tombs goes on to say this in 27 woe to you scribes and pharisee you hypocrites for you're like whitewashed tombs which outwardly appear beautiful but within are full of dead man's bones and all uncleanness so you outwardly appear righteous to others but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness so you look good. And this is happening on both sides of the river, but we're just talking about Judah. Is this actually happening in modern Judaism, Hebrew roots, Messianic movements? Matthew 23, 29, 31. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites, for you build the tombs, look at this, of the prophets, and you decorate the monuments of the righteous. So you give this appearance of honoring them. Saying, if we lived in the days of our fathers, whoa, there's no way we would have taken part in shedding the blood of these guys. Not us. We wouldn't have done what they did back then to these guys. We're good. We would have listened to them. They have Messiah standing in front of them in the flesh. And they can't hear this to the degree where they're going to do exactly that. And he knew this. Look at this. This is his answer, his response. Thus you witness against yourselves. Now, Yeshua knows that he's going to be put to death for what he is saying. 
Look what he says here. Thus you witness against yourselves that you are the sons of those who murdered the prophets. You're going to do to me what, what they did to them. You're no different, except you're going to do it at a higher level now. They weren't Messiah. Sorry, I was saying we're going to. Everybody offended? <laughs> We <laughs> hang in there if you're not. I'll get you before we're done. Let's let's be biblical, not political. The United Nations, starting with the Balfour Declaration in 1917 and 18, started produce or paved the way to 1948, which gave birth to the modern nation of what we think of as the modern state of Israel. That is what we have today. But the promises back in Bereshit in 15 are far different, if you read the Torah, as to what the restoration of the land of Israel is. And what I've got up there, just be very clear, what you see today is a modern state of Israel, which I believe has the right to exist, which I have many good <laughs> Jewish brethren in, which I am not sitting here and speaking against. But let us not mistake this as the fulfillment of Abraham's promise, because it is not. Now, the modern state of Israel, interestingly enough, is a part of end times prophecy, but not the way most people think or taught. But I want to make it very clear. What we see today does not equal these promises. There's no way around this. That does not mean that the tribes of the house of Israel are not in what we call the modern state of Israel today. It does not mean that the father does not uh, love those who are trying to seek him and be in there. It doesn't mean that from a secular political point of view that it doesn't have a right to exist. But I'm not going to take all of that and say suddenly that means it's fulfilling scripture prophetically. We've got to be very, very careful here what's happening. What is going on here? Do you know, in the revelation of Messiah, we see something interesting to the various Kahal. We see two interesting statements given here. It says here in Revelation 2, 9, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. The slander. So this, this is a Kahal who's getting it right. Look at this. The slander of those who say they are Jews and are not. Whoa, do you mean as we come to the end of the age, you're going to be those who claim to be Jews and are not, according to the revelation of Messiah, but are the synagogue of Satan? Now, it doesn't mean they're walking around with glowing eyes and, you know, it, it's some sort of demonic. What it's saying is they are of the adversary of the kahol or the gathering. They're in a place of adversarial to the truth. It's not saying they're, that, you know, that they're not going to overcome, they're not going to go into repentance, and his, his blood doesn't cover him and he doesn't love him. What it's saying is they're making a claim that is not true, and as a result, they have become an adversary to the kahal, to the gatherings. That's all it's saying here. Don't get some sort of you know, weird thing that this is a bunch of you know, Satan worshipers just, you know, doing stuff. It's just making the statement. again. We see this, and it's interesting, you know, I believe this one's to uh, Philadelphia in Revelation 3, 9. Behold, I will make those, look at this, again it mentions it, those who are the adversary of the gathering, of the kahal, of the ecclesia, who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. Now, that doesn't... It doesn't mean that when you're lying that you know you're lying. It says in the, as we come to the end times, there will be many that are deceived and being deceived. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Even though they can make the claims that we hold the scepter and we this and we're the authority on everything, and suddenly there's going to be a prophet Micah that stands up and says, no, my master is the authority and he holds the scepter. 
In other words, there's going to be those right at the end that are not going to acknowledge that the king actually holds the scepter and is on the throne now. And almost 2,000 years ago, what the coming of Messiah represented was a huge offense. And yet the last 2,000 years, they have been without temple. They've been without the promises of Abraham. They have been without all of these things. History has proven that Yeshua was correct. And what John wrote here on the island of Patmos is not us being anti-Jewish. It's saying that there's going to be a hijacking of the name of the tribe of Yehuda, be it good intent or not. And it's going to be used as a part of becoming an adversarial position to the truth. I've got here the all-seeing eye of Horus. Of course, um, our American brother would be very much, this is on your $1 uh, greenback. So this is what the U.S. uses as its currency, standard currency. What's on there are the mystery cult religions. So you've got Anuet, uh, Sepetis, Novus Ordo Seclorum, um, basically, uh, we, be, we will be successful with a new world order. And they call it the Great Seal. And so this sits on the currency of uh, the representing currency of the United States. But what's interesting in here is that you will see a link back to Mystery Babylon and the occultic religions. And this has made its way on, at least for now, the, the uh, standard currency of the earth. But at some point, Mystery Babylon is going to get devoured by the beast system. But it's interesting what we've got here, what we're seeing, this link into these mystery religions. In the modern state of Israel, I've got a picture here that's within the courthouse. And uh, when I visited this and, and I sat there, it was really interesting because it's quite sobering. What you're seeing is looking down 33 steps. Now, if you know, there's a first 30 and then there's a plateau and then there's a final three steps that go up to a very interesting monument that's in the courthouse overlooking the modern state of Israel. And so you're looking at the steps as if I'm standing at the top and you start walking up them. Now, in, in, within the Freemasonry um, uh, uh, order, they have 33 degrees. When you hit the 33rd, you start to come into what's full enlightenment. Now, what's interesting in this modern state is that's what you will stand before. Okay, you're seeing the mystery of cult religions have come in. Now, this is the courthouse overseeing all of Israel. This is the judgments of the house of Israel. Think what Mike is saying. You're ruling what you are doing to the people, what, what's going on here. So you've got this incredible expression that has mystery Babylon sort of all over it in the ruling of the modern state of Israel right now. So we've got an incredible shadow picture playing out. That's a picture of the courthouse in the air, and you'll see the pyramid with the eye and it poking up right over the top. And if you were to be at the very top of this, you will oversee and look around at 360 degrees over the modern state of Israel. And I've been there. And it's quite sobering. And you realize, Micah's words might have some relevance to us today. <laughs> Because a lot of the Hebrew, it's messianic movements, by the way, are looking to modern Judaism for the authority to tell them the truth. Yet I can tell you there's some interesting things going on in the land right now, or in a part of the land. In this order, you know, what we see here, these 33 steps to enlightenment and everything else, you will see that they have this eye of providence, as they call it, you know, this eye of God. And all this sort of thing. What God? You know, and what's going on here? This is outside the courthouse there, and you'll see that they've put their stamp on it. And, you know, this is Solomon's pillar, and they have the lodge right beside it uh, in this sort of a thing. And so you can see all the symbolism that's, uh, that's sitting all around there. And then in the courtyard uh, of the courthouse, you will see an obelisk and all these sorts of things. So your ruling authorities right now in this modern Judaism over the actual land we call the modern state of Israel is entertaining some of the mystery religions 
And of course, the secret knowledge that comes with that and the enlightenment or the illumination. So something's being entertained that is ruling over this situation. It's contaminated. Okay, the witness four and by Jeremiah. So let's go back. We've looked at this scripture in the previous teaching, but let's go back to this now. Okay, so think of now what we've got as we come to the end of this age, the coming of uh, Yeshua HaMashiach, and we're seeing this play out. Now, look at this. Then the officials and all the people said to the priests and the prophets, the officials. So the officials at this time are going, okay, let's remember, as, as Jeremiah is bringing back some news, you're about to get it. Judgment's falling. They're saying, well, let's remember the words of Micah. And so they go back to Micah of his little town, Morasheth, um, and how he had prophesied in these days. I think we're going to see this again within even the modern state of Israel. There's going to be awakening that's going to start to occur. It's not going to be about modern Judaism as we understand. It's not going to be about Messianic and Hebrew roots movements and all of this kind of stuff that's going on. It's going to be true people are going to stand up and go, let us remember the warnings of Micah. Because things are going wrong, real wrong, real fast. Could we see this again as we come to the end? It didn't change that the judgment was going to go forth. It did. But it doesn't mean that some of the officials and the people didn't start to wake up. But the judgment was imminent. You're infested. Your wrong ruling is affecting the whole land. Yeshua, after the incident with the money changers and lenders and how upset he was with that whole scene, produced an interesting conversation following this, but he, you, I'll read here from Matthew 27, 3, 5. It says, you should have left the temple and was going away. So he's created quite a scene, <laughs> All right? So this is, this is quite something. Um, the fruit of our Messiah's lips wouldn't have looked so nice if you were on the receiving end of this. When his disciples came out to him, uh, to point out the buildings of the temple. What's going on? What are you doing? He says, but he answered them, you shall see all these. Oh, sorry, you, you see all these, do you not? So he's going, take a look. Take a look at the courthouses. Look at the glory of all of this. Yeshua is doing it almost 2,000 years ago at this time. You see all these things, do you not? Truly, I say to you, there will not be one, uh, there will not be left one here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. I promise you, when Yeshua HaMashiach returns, as we come to the end of this age, when our line of the tribe of Judah, our king, our bridegroom, our Messiah returns, that courthouse will not be standing. But it won't be at our hand. Look what's going on here. As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us when will these things be? You're telling me that the temple, as we understand it, is going to be destroyed? And this is what he says. Tell us what these things will be and what will be the sign of, the, of your coming in the end of the age. They want to know two things. When's that going to happen? And what's going to be the sign of your return at the end of the age? All of this is being linked into a destruction physically occurring in the land over a ruling authority. John 2, 17, 22, this is recorded. His disciples remembered that it was written, this is interesting, zeal for your house will consume me. Now, this is a reference to King David in his time of repentance in his Psalms and in tears, he was writing something. And so we know the seed line of David eventually led to Yeshua. And so there's an interesting connection they are making with the word. They didn't have New Testaments. They only had the Torah and, and uh, the writings and the prophets. So, they're remembering the words of King David now. 
zeal for your house will consume me. So the Jews said to him, so the ruling, the leaders, what sign do you show us for doing these things? And Yeshua would answer him, look at this, answer them and said, destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up. <laughs> Imagine you're the ruling authority and this is the fruit of the lips of Messiah acting in the full 100% capacity of prophet. Destroy this temple, and in three days, we'll raise it up. The Jews said to him, it took us 46 years to build this temple. And you're going to raise it in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. This is interesting. The word being used for temple here all throughout is naos. It's not herion, which means the building. The actual naos is the holy of holies. In other words, your holy of holies is what I'm actually tearing down. Do you know the presence of Elohim was never in that place they called set apart in Herod's temple? He's saying, your holy of holies, your naos, it's going. And the real one's going to be raised up and I'm going to do it in three days. What do you think he was referring to? Do you think that might be the resurrection? (laughs) Where therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered what he had said. This and they... And they believed the scripture and not the word uh, and the word that Yeshua had spoken. Okay, let's bring this to a close. Right ruling is coming to a planet near you. (laughs) Okay. And, and I'm sorry, Elon Musk, it's not Mars. All right. This planet is called earth and right ruling is coming We're getting close. And all that will be judged in the house first will be judged as a part of what he is about to do in the fulfillment of the fall Moedim and a part of the sheep and goats judgment and the part of the age and to start the final age to come in his great plan of redemption. Don't be surprised that we're back here again. Mike is warning of it. Isaiah, then it happens. Then they get back there. And now Yeshua is doing it personally as a part of him fulfilling the spring melody. The line of the tribe of Judah is coming and right ruling will be coming with him. But there must be a judgment before the right ruling comes in. We are not going to achieve this. I'm certainly not going to be against my brethren that are currently in the modern state of Israel and all the politics that are going on. My encouragement to everybody here is be biblical now at this time not political it is very important now as the clock is ticking to the coming of messiah as to where we will receive our understanding will it be from the prophets that micah said do not listen to these they are in darkness or will we hear the fruit of the lips of the micahs right now there's few of them There is few of them, particularly in Judah and the Hebrew and Messianic movements. And and, and even the ones that are doing to, they're only focused purely on the fear side, not the repentance side, not the blood of Messiah side. It's all just fear. Without any understanding. But perfect love will cast out all fear. And our Messiah is love. We're going to go to the great prophet Zechariah to finish today's teaching. This is 2, 11, 12. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for behold, I come and I will dwell in your midst, declares Yah. And many nations shall be joined to Yah. In that day, this great day of the final part of the age, the plan of redemption, and shall be my people, and I will dwell in the midst of you. Just so you know, we're talking about the end of this age. We're talking about the second coming right now. And you shall know that Elo, the Elohim of hosts has sent me to you. And you shall inherit Yehuda, his portion. And in the Holy Land. And shall choose 
Jerusalem again. So even though this judgment is coming, Yah has not abandoned her. But as we come to the end of this age and we see all these great religions and the mystery cult religions and everything that's going on and the Temple Mount and Islam's fighting for it and Christianity tries to stake its claim and modern Judaism staking its claim and the whole thing's corrupted with the mystery religions, all of them. Not just Christianity, not just Islam, not just modern Judaism. Every single thing that is not the actual faith is mystery Babylon. And they are corrupt. But there's the promise here. He's going to choose her again. We are coming to the end of the age, not the end of the world. And it's all the promise of him dwelling in our midst. Let's finish there. And we'll come back. Go grab yourself coffee, whatever you got to do. And uh, we'll come back for, uh, for some questions and answers. <laughs>